an Earth Day like no other. While you're home, tune into Mad Radio's Earth Day broadcast. And how's it going, everybody? Welcome into Earth Day 2020, presented by Mav Radio. FM. Not ideal circumstances, but we are still here doing the show. We have some great stories on tap for you today. Thanks for joining us. We're doing it over Zoom, obviously with the coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. Forces to change things a little bit, but we're still putting this show together. I am Ben Howick, joined by my good friend, Matt Kirkle. Matt, how are you doing today? I mean, this is definitely unique circumstances indeed. Uh, this, it's cool to see Earth Day being done every year. This year, obviously, we're having to, you know, play with the situation, the current climate of, of America right now, having to do this on Zoom. But I'm really excited to be here. I think this is going to be a great uh, event. Like you said, a lot of great stories on tap today. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. And we do have some awesome stories on tap today. Some things that look at nature, some things that look at the world we live in, some things that look at the people in our world. Uh, what, is, what, what to you, Matt, does Earth Day mean? I think it's something that can mean a lot of different things, and you'll see that over the course of some of these stories today. What does Earth Day mean to you? Um, honestly, I think the, the best answer to that question, in my opinion, is honestly, it can mean so many different things. And, and like you said, you'll see that with these stories. I mean, we have stories that branch in so many different genres that don't just, just center around the simplicity of just Earth Day. You know, we have things that, you know, go as far as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We have stories that you know, tie into many different genres all surrounding, you know, Earth Day. And I think that that's really cool that you can find so many different things to, to find meaning in Earth Day. Um, so I think that that's really cool. And I think there's so many different ways that, um, you know, you can find ways for Earth Day to be meaningful to you. Um, but I think that this is going to be a very, very cool event for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And something Mav Radio we like to do every single year. So we're still very happy to be doing it this year. And we're going to kick things off with a story about a former president that had his start right here in Omaha. The election is fast approaching this November, and the Democratic primaries for Nebraska are happening next month. Out of the 45 presidents that have served in the United States, one of them is from Omaha. Reporter Joey Colbert walks through the birth site and tells the story of former U.S. President Gerald R. Ford. Field Club is one of Omaha's historic neighborhoods located north of Hanscom Park. Field Club is home to the old Victorian-style houses from the late 1800s. One of the homes isn't standing today, but it once housed the 38th president of the United States. That man is Gerald Ford. The Ford bird site is a significant place for people to visit and walk their dogs. Omaha resident Randall Penner lives down the street from the Ford bird site for a few years. He has visited the birth site several times whenever he goes out for an afternoon walk. Although it has been almost 45 years since the place has been created, Penner felt that there are some great takeaways from when he visited the place. However, he does mention that the park has been neglected for the past few years and could use some repairments. Yeah, I think they could do potentially more with it uh, as far as uh, drawing more attention to it, taking better care of the grounds. Um, you know, there's been some recent damage to the, to the front gates from a, from a car accident but uh, they haven't gotten repaired yet. Gerald Ford is a well-known political figure from Nebraska. With the park being in bad state and some damages across the property, there needs to be a history lesson about Gerald Ford and why he's important to Nebraska. Let's start from the beginning. Gerald Ford wasn't the original birth name for the 38th president. Ford was born on July 14, 1913, to his father's name, Leslie Lynch King. Ford had a short time there after his birth. UNO history professor Mary Lyons Carmona says Ford lived in Omaha for about 13 days. He and his mother had to move out of the state because of his abusive father. Within a couple months, his mother and father broke up, and later in life when he was asked about it, he said that he found out that his father was alcoholic. And had uh, abused his mother. Ford and his mother moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan soon after the divorce. His mother later remarried his soon-to-be stepfather by the name of Gerald Rudolph Ford. That's when Ford's name began to change. He never legally adopted her son, but they immediately went over to calling him Gerald Ford. In the 1930s, Ford attended the University of Michigan and played football for the Wolverines. After his time in Ann Arbor, Ford attended law school at Yale University. He also served in the Pacific during World War II. According to the History website, Ford's time in the Oval Office began when the Watergate scandal surfaced in the air following Richard Nixon's re-election campaign in 1972. 
After Nixon's Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned from office in 1973, Nixon appointed Ford to take over as his right-hand man. It came to him pretty quickly, this young House Minority Leader from Michigan, Jerry Ford, former football player, served in World War II, served in the Pacific, had a good reputation personally, but he also professionally had a very good reputation. After less than a year serving as vice president, Nixon resigned in 1974 in order to avoid facing an impeachment trial from the Watergate scandal. That's when Ford took oath to become the next president. By his becoming president, he had to heal a lot of the wounds that had been afflicted by Nixon. President Ford served the last two years of Nixon's second term in office. Probably the most significant thing he did while serving was pardoning Nixon from criminal charges related to the Watergate scandal. Outside of the scandal, Ford was also known for granting amnesty for draft evaders from the Vietnam War. And some would say, well, it's kind of like a pardon. So maybe that's how he saw things, like let things go. These people paid their price, a lot of the draft evaders had spent time in jail or spent time in Canada down the run. Overall, Ford had to pick up the pieces left behind Nixon. Professor Carmona said that Ford was plagued by the bad inflation in the economy and the high unemployment rate during his term. Ford ran for another term in the 1976 election, but lost to Jimmy Carter. After Ford's time as president, he worked on several PSAs, including one with Jimmy Carter on the space program. With a communications satellite, we can be. That's one way space technology impacts on life here on Earth. Television, telephone, and radio signals bounced off satellites bring people together who are thousands of miles apart. They bring us world events as they're happening. Ford also supported his wife Betty through several tumbles in her life. She had breast cancer while he was president. She had problems with, uh, they would probably call opium, uh, the painkillers they gave her for breast cancer, and she drank alcohol. Ford supported his wife by funding a lot of money for breast cancer research. He and his wife also created the Betty Ford Treatment Center. Ford died at the age of 93 on December 26, 2006 in California. The Ford birth site was created 30 years prior to celebrate the former president's achievements. Gerald helped created the Rose Garden in 1980 to dedicate his wife Betty. The Conservation Center holds a private exhibit on Gerald Ford with a display of some of his belongings. However, Professor Carmona said they didn't have any memorabilia from his presidency. His presidential papers and almost all the presidential artifacts are in Michigan. Although the birth site doesn't provide any of Ford's presidential belongings, they do have a beautiful park dedicated to his legacy. As you walk through the place, you're surrounded by a beautiful rose garden, the brick structures and pillars simulating the White House. There are also several granite plaques that list the Nebraska governors and the U.S. presidents that served in office. On the west side, you can find the head statues of Gerald and Betty Ford. At the center of the birth site, there is a time capsule that has yet to be opened and a small gazebo with a small exhibit containing some of Ford's artifacts. They have sort of, it's kind of like a dollhouse type replica of Ford's house and they have a painting of the house. The Ford birth site is a prominent location for people to walk their pets, take family pictures, or even have weddings. Penner says it's a historical landmark here in Omaha. It's a nice uh, park type setting. Um, yeah, they do a really good job with the flowers, obviously. Uh, there's a road, rose garden that's uh, dedicated to, to Betty Ford, but there's also the footprint of the original Ford home there that's, that's really cool, which they've kind of designed um, around the, the eastern part of the, the birth site. Overall, Penner says it's a great experience visiting a site that was once the home of a former president. Yeah, I think it's always interesting, you know, especially if you have a chance to see a presidential library or a birth site or anything related to the presidency. It's, it's always good to take time and, and, and spend a little bit of time there and, and learn some things. As for the people in Omaha, it's one of those moments realizing how big of a deal it was that one of the presidents was born in their neighborhood. It doesn't happen very often in Nebraska. Well, that's the only uh, president out of 45 presidents that was born here, so that's, that's very significant. So, um, you know, that in itself is, is pretty special. I think Omaha will be very, very proud. They do claim him as their son. Just it's a very short time that he lived here, but they, they don't have any problems claiming him. For MavRadio.fm, I'm Joey Colbert. The Gerald R. Ford birth site is open to the public. The birth site is host to several weddings, senior pictures, and family pictures. If you want a, to visit a private exhibit at the Conservation Center, you can call or email them to schedule in a visit.
We now bring in Joey Colbert. Joey was going to be at the site today, but obviously has been closed due to the coronavirus. Joey, how are you doing today, my man? I'm doing pretty good, Ben. How are you doing? Good. Looks like you're enjoying the nice weather here in the month of April. Um, on your visit to Jared Awkward's first place, what's the current condition of the place and what goes on there? Well, I mean, it's a beautiful park. You see a little exhibit at the gazebo with all the belongings from Ford, like golf clubs. You see a replica of the dollhouse for the original home. But pretty much there, there was an accident, as mentioned in the story a couple months ago. They have been working on fixing the pillars. That's all done, the brick pillars. They just need to fix up the fence. Uh, last month, I visited the, the gazebo, and one of the windows had – a few holes in them. They looked like bullet holes, but I'm not sure if they're fixed right now, but I'm sure they'll fix them in the future. And but you it's, mentioned it's, the house isn't standing today. What what happened to Ford's birth home? You mentioned it a little bit. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, the house was on fire in 1971. There was a fire. I did not see what the cause was, but the fire did not burn down the house. The fire was just so bad that the city of Omaha decided to tear the place down. So in 76, they actually turned the place into a memorial or a birth site conservation center for Gerald Ford. And fortunately, he was president around that time. That's pretty cool to have a name like Gerald R. Ford attached to the city of Omaha. What are some of the interesting facts you learned about Ford in his early days here in Nebraska? Well, he was only here for 13 days and then his mother divorced his original father, then married Gerald Rudolph Ford, which is his father's name. They moved to Grant Rapids, and Ford attended the University of Michigan, as mentioned in the story. He played football for the Wolverines and for, I think, three years. He led the Wolverines to two consecutive undefeated seasons, two national championships. He played center, long snapper, and linebacker. Also, he went to law school at Yale, and then because after Pearl Harbor, he was inspired to serve in the Navy at, at World War II in the Pacific. Very cool stuff, Joey. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for the story. Stay safe. Love the shades, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Matt? Yeah, we actually have a great story coming up. Um, from the outside of the Felius Cat Cafe, you can already see paintings of cats. And as you walk in, you can into this quaint cafe, you can already smell the aroma of the best smelling coffee imaginable. Reporter Jeremy Davis takes us on a tour of the Felius Cat Cafe and what the place is all about. When you approach Phileas, you see a large window and can see a multitude of furry felines wandering around and just lounging. When you enter the cafe, your senses are overwhelmed by the pleasant aroma of coffee and tea. Once you're in Phileas Cat Cafe, then you approach the cat-themed counter and order from a variety of cat-themed items, like the Tiger Shake or the Cafe Meow. The Cafe Meow checks all the boxes of a great coffee. It contains espresso, honey, and cinnamon. While paying for the coffee, they then ask if you would like to pay for entrance to the cat cuddle room for either an hour or 30 minutes. This is where the cafe really shines. Once you sign the waiver to enter the cuddle room, you can head on to what really makes this cafe special. You have paid for your visit, then you head to the next room where you wash your hands. This is done for the safety of cats along with keeping yourself healthy. After washing your hands, you enter a room that is filled with cats' favorite things like beds, toys, cat trees for climbing. Multiple cats inhabit this cafe at the same time. I sat down with Megan, a volunteer who watches the cats during the day, who is here to answer any questions visitors may have. It's really nice. The community is really supportive. I feel like a lot of places like this, either there's good coffee or it's fun, not both. And that's what's nice. You get good coffee and you get to have fun with cats. A place that has great coffee and tons of cats to play with? What's not to love? Yeah, some people just come here for the coffee and just sit outside and study and at the table. There are plenty of places the cats get to relax and toys for the guests to use to play with the cats as well. A lot of the things in here are donated. People donate um, blankets, towels, they donate little cat beds, cat houses, everything. Litter, food, they get a place where they can be comfortable and hang out with other cats and be socialized while they're waiting for a home. The cats have ample space to do what they enjoy, whether that be laying around or wandering around the loftier spaces of the cuddle room. There are plenty of cats here, but where does Phileas find all of them? Um, some of them came as strays or some of them came from other homes and the well, owners weren't able to take care them. of them. Yeah, we have um, people out in the community that do like trap neuter release. And then we have people out mm -hmm. in the community that are just like fostering other cats for us and they bring them in. And some of them came in as strays as well. 
And then we have had um, the occasional cat that like got left here. Somebody would like bring in a cat and take them in. So some people may be wondering how to get involved and help like Megan is doing. There's an online application that you fill out and then they just contact you and ask you um, if you'd still be willing and if you're able to volunteer and then you just sign up on a, a Google Doc for what times you're available. Switch it up whenever you want. Yeah, it's such a great gig. I don't even consider it volunteering, honestly. It's so much fun. <laughs> just get to come here, hang out with cats for a couple hours every week and it's good stress relief after school and stuff, so. How'd this little coffee shop get started? Well, Philia's Cat Cafe has a board of directors of women who want to change the world for the better. Brie Fallon is the founder and president. Although I know a lot of people can't wait to visit now that I've told you all about it, but currently, due to the COVID-19 epidemic, Philia's Cat Cafe will be closed through March 31st. But if you're looking to still help out, you can check out their website and support them right now. I'm Jeremy Davis for MavRadio.fm. If you would like to take a visit to the Felius Cat Cafe, you can book online or just drop off in to start enjoying the best the Cat Cafe has to offer. The whole cafe menu is listed on their website, Felius.org. Reporter Jeremy Davis couldn't be at the cafe, obviously, today with the conditions, but he's standing by ready to answer some questions. Jeremy, first and foremost, can you tell us how the adoption process works if you want to potentially take home one of the cats at the cafe? Yeah, so it's actually quite easy. So you just head on over to phileas.org and they actually have uh, all their policy and their standards and everything on their website. And then you can uh, click adopt now and it takes you to this link. And you just fill out an application that kind of get started and get in line to get a cat. It's quite, quite easy, very awesome. Now, how long does it take typically for a cat to find a home? So it all depends on getting the right uh, person to walk in and see that cat. And uh, uh, usually it doesn't take very long. It usually happens in the first couple of weeks. And uh, it's real easy to find cats homes when you, uh, you know, can just hang out with them for an hour or so and get to know them. And then you want to take them home. And, you know, the cat cuddle room is definitely the moneymaker, something that interests me, something that makes me want to go there. Um, how much does it cost to enter the cat cuddle room? All right. So it costs uh, for the smallest amount of time. It's seven fifty for 30 minutes. And then for an hour session, it costs $14. And then after that, each additional hour is $10. So it's not a whole lot, but it's still enough. And what it does is it goes and it gets donated to the cats to help them. Oh, that's amazing. Now, are there any final thoughts or comments that you'd like to make regarding the Feely's Cat Cafe? Yeah, just a couple of things. And so on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, if you bring in your student ID, there's actually a student discount on uh, the cat room. And so you can get 25% off by doing that. So that's a great deal for students. And also, uh, I wanted to, you know, have you meet the cats over the call, but uh, we couldn't do that today. And so uh, if anybody wants to head on line, they have a couple cats right now. You can go to uh, Adopt Now and see what cats they have on there right now. There's a couple of cute ones you can check out. Uh, Bugsin, Jillian, and McLaurin. They're all very nice felines. And so uh, thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for telling such a great story about the, the Felius Cat Cafe. Um, back to you, Ben. Thanks, Matt. Part of what makes Earth Day so special is talking about the ways we can help improve the Earth we live in. And as people are becoming more aware of the carbon footprint, they want to find ways to help to reduce it. With the limits of recycling, people are pushing a new movement, living waste free. Reporter Sophia Ritter explains the impacts of single use plastics and how to work towards a waste free lifestyle. Picture a typical grocery store. Walking down each aisle, you find a vast variety of products. Water bottles, peanut butter, cereal. Nearly every product in a grocery store is made of some form of plastic packaging. You buy these products all the time, and when you're done, you toss them in the trash, and that item is then gone from your mind. Dr. Zachary Suriano, a geography professor at UNO, has published articles on the impacts of climate change and says that plastics take longer to break down than most people realize. It's usually centuries 
uh, in the plural it would take for most plastics to break down. What usually happens first is that the plastics actually break down into smaller pieces, these microplastics that aren't biodegrading, they're just becoming harder and harder to see, but yet the, their hardness, their toxicity perhaps, is still just as prevalent. According to an article published by Environmental Science and Pollution Research Potential by Shivika Sharma and Subhankar Chattery in 2017, harmful effects of microplastics on humans include infertility, obesity, and cancer. Sharma and Chatterjee reported that microplastics are present in nearly all marine environments. Americans have been using single-use plastics since the 1970s. They have been contested against for years, but many young people are getting desperate to see a change made soon. Savannah Schofield is an 18-year-old wildlife and sustainability advocate that has worked all over the world, from Yellowstone to Australia. The problems facing our world are never far from her mind. Like, literally last week, I had a breakdown. Like, the bushfires happened. There are entire cities being drowned in water. Um, the Great Barrier Reef is experiencing a bleaching right now because of higher temperatures in the area. Weird thing I learned the other day, polar bears are resorting, resorting to cannibalism, mm -hmm. and people are being affected. People are dying. Plastic has infiltrated every part of our lives, and it can be easy to overlook how much of an impact we each have. Because it's really easy to be ignorant about how our actions have consequences. We take out our trash, we put it in the bin, and somebody comes and takes it away and we feasibly never see it again. But in reality, that all has to go somewhere. A study done by Columbia University estimates that the average American produces seven pounds of materials per day. America produces three times as much as the global average, according to Global Citizen. Savannah is worried about these lack of actions the United States is taking. America is seen as this strong kid on the playground a little bit. People look to us. And if we're not doing the right things on the environmental standards, then they'll say, oh, we don't have to care about the environment either. And then it's, it's not beneficial for anybody. Savannah is frustrated by how world leaders seem more worried about current finances than preserving our environment. If your thoughts are not with the future generation, if you're not supporting the future generation, then you're just supporting yourselves. And a selfish world won't get us anywhere. A selfish, a selfish world is, is going to die. A big problem with single-use plastics is how hard it is for plastics to be recycled. Lee Neary from Exist Green in Dundee, a store specializing in living waste-free, says that most people don't realize the process their recycling goes through. When you recycle plastic in particular, it gets downcycled each time. Like your plastic water bottle is never going to be a new plastic water bottle. It's going to be um, saran wrap and, because it can, plastic can only be downcycled into a lower quality plastic. And then like saran wrap's not recyclable, so then that will end up in the landfill. This doesn't mean you should stop recycling. If you have something that is recyclable, Still recycle it. I'm not saying not to recycle it. Think of it like you're throwing it away. Lee lives waste-free, which means that she doesn't use any products with disposable packaging, or are meant for single use. She left her job as an environmental engineer to start her waste-free store, Exist Green. She recommends taking small steps to people looking to start a waste-free lifestyle. Next thing you throw away, Google like what a reusable alternative would be for that. So you know, whether it's a piece of floss, you know, that is usually plastic. There's compostable re options that come in reusable containers. At her store, Exist Green, you bring in your own containers to be filled. This cuts out plastic packaging from the food and beauty supplies we buy. Exist Green in Dundee is the only store in Omaha entirely dedicated to being waste-free. While some stores, such as Hy-Vee, are starting to implement some resources such as greens as waste-free options. Lee hopes her store can become more than just a shopping experience. But I do want it to be more of like almost like a museum too. Like you can walk through and be like, oh, I never even thought of this being an option. It can be easy to get overwhelmed by all the elements that go into living zero waste. With the limited resources in a town like Omaha, it is unrealistic to say that a waste-free life will work for everyone. Instead, Dr. Zachary Soriano recommends slowly changing daily habits. Implement a number of small scale steps that are very achievable, whether that's you know, phasing out or completely eliminating the use of single use water bottles and go with something renewable that you can fill up. If you were to figure out the cost of that water the, itself you know, per ounce or per gallon, and then determine the price of a single use or reusable water bottle, one costs about $1,500, one costs about $11 per year. Um, 
So yes, it's great for the environment, but that's an extra 1400 bucks you have in your pocket to use for as you see fit by making the decision to cut down on these single use products. Next time you reach for a water bottle or pop bottle, think about how that bottle will be around for centuries. Make it a goal to use one less plastic bottle every week. Lee says to remember the zero waste slogan. We don't need 100 people doing waste free perfectly, we need thousands of people doing it imperfectly. Savannah says it's never too late to make a difference on our planet, even though it may seem like all hope is lost. Yes, we may have already lost the fight with all this stuff, but that doesn't mean we don't keep fighting. For Mavradio.fm, I'm Sophia Ritter. Exist Green opened this year. During this time, it has held informational talks to teach people more about the impacts of their waste. They also offer free composting to anyone, which includes all food waste. You can visit them Tuesday through Sunday at 4914 Underwood Avenue in Dundee. Dundee excuse me. We are now joined by Sophia Ritter. Sophia, thanks for joining us today. Um, first question, how has Exist Green adapted for the coronavirus? So Exist Green, like many businesses, has to operate completely different than normal. Right now, they are only taking deliveries when you have to go up to their front door and you have to order either by emailing them at orders at existscreen.com or by calling them and submitting an order on their website. Right now, they are just one of many small businesses struggling in Omaha because of the pandemic. And they are currently making 40 to 50% of what they usually do. She's had to reduce her staff down to just herself and her manager, but she's feeling pretty optimistic. She says that her loyal customers are really helping her right now, and she thinks they'll be able to make it through this. And obviously, because of this pandemic, many grocery stores aren't allowing customers to bring bags from home because they are worried about them being contaminated. If bags aren't safe, how is it safe to bring in your own containers? So uh, Exist Green, you normally bring in your own containers. And regardless of an ongoing pandemic or not, they are always sanitized before they are used. And so right now, in order to keep their store waste-free, because that's their full mission, they are asking people to come in and donate their own tomato jars, pasta jars, old jars, just so they can keep it waste-free. And all of their um, products are thoroughly sanitized, so it's just as safe as getting any other product from a grocery store right now. Obviously, we're always trying to limit our carbon footprint. What's one waste-free product you're going to start incorporating into your life? Well, my big thing is I'm trying to eliminate the unnecessary single-use plastic in my life, such as Ziploc bags or pop bottles and water bottles, just because even though we think when we recycle something, we are getting rid of the impact it has in the environment, we truly aren't. It is just like throwing it away. So I'm just trying to keep in my mind, every time I throw something away, that item will then last centuries. So is it really worth it for convenience of one water bottle? It's an awesome point to make. Uh, why is it just as important ever now to be considering your carbon footprint? I was talking about Lee with this the other day, and she agreed with me that right now is a, we have way more time on our life, in our lives than we normally do. And it's a great time to kind of reevaluate how we're living and use this extra time to maybe think about starting composting, think about more, reuse, more effective ways we can be just um more effective ways we can just care about the environment right now. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks for your story. Uh, enjoy the weather and um, we'll see, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Matt? Now, sticking on the feline trend, uh, similar to the story that we had earlier from Jeremy, um, cats make up the backbone of the internet with their adorable expressive faces and their viral videos. But do your fluffy friends harbor something a little less adorable? Our, a reporter, R.C. Miller, highlights a study going on right here at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, that involves your feline friends and what you can do to help this study. Tens of millions of people in the United States own a cat, and like Talon Flynn, they wouldn't have it any other way. Hey, Lokes, what are you doing? Ah, uh, we got him in November. Almost 20% of cats carry parasites that can have some strange effects on not only other pets, but people as well. Give them a checkup, you know, kind of make sure the kitty's healthy. Toxoplasma gondii, or Toxo for short, is an extremely common parasite that can infect just about any warm-blooded animal, including cats and humans. Dr. Chase is the faculty member managing Toxo Project, a research study at UNO's Department of Psychology that looks to better understand the behavioral effects of the parasite in cats. You can get the parasite from eating um, meat that's infected, um, that's raw. So, you know, um, if 
if a, cat, if a, a cow has it and you eat raw beef or you eat oysters and the water has it, um, you, oh, you're at so risk of, of getting it. Once infected, the parasite is known to cause behavioral changes in those creatures. Some behavioral changes noticed include more impulsive behavior and a dull fear response to potentially deadly situations. In humans, there appears to be a trend with people who have the parasite and a higher likelihood to be in a car accident, prolonged reaction times, and an impairment in long-term concentration. The effects in humans is dulled, but can pose a major health risk to those that have a weak or compromised immune system, says Dr. Chase. If you're infected as an adult, you usually have an immune response that keeps it in check. But if you're infected as an uh, immunocompromised individual or a fetus who is, doesn't have a fully developed immune system, again, whether it's human or cat, it, it is uh, an issue uh, for the viability and health of the fetus. The species that is most affected by the parasite is rats and mice. These critters seem to lose all sense of fear once infected. They actually become attracted to cats. This makes sense from the parasite's perspective, as the cat's digestive tract is the only place it can reproduce. Muhammad Ali Tama, a graduate student leading the charge of the Toxo project, says Toxo makes the mouse or rat an easy meal for the cat, which of course would never pass up a free meal. But once the mouse is eaten, what happens to the cat? So we have evidence that the parasite is present in the brain of cats, mm -hmm. but no one has looked uh, whether or not the presence of the parasite in the brain would similarly affect the behavior of the cat affected cats. They hypothesize that the parasite might be having a subtle effect on cats, making them cover more areas than they normally would and intruding on the territory of other cats that they would normally avoid. But studying cats is not as easy as you might think, says Dr. Chase. Yeah, and as you know, cats are sort of enigmatic creatures. Um, they're, they can be very friendly, they can be very, you know, no. not <laughs> friendly or isolated or just secretive. Um, and so, you know, we were sort of initially interested, are there, is that related to Toxo at all? The ongoing study relies on people from around the community to bring in their cat to be put through several tests, such as placing a cat in a room with a predator scent and recording the reaction. The only way to know for sure if Toxo is present is via blood test. This looks for antibodies in the blood that signal an immune response to fight the parasite. Dr. Chase stressed that they never infect cats. In fact, that would affect the data, says Dr. Chase. The reason we don't infect animals is because there are risks. And, you know, it also isn't a natural situation. We're interested in more, if it makes sense, ecologically relevant um, scenario. And infecting cats in a laboratory isn't the same as what they experience outside. Currently, they have tested over 190 cats during the first phase of the study, with the next phase of the study to begin rolling out soon. And they intend to bring out some new technology to help them out. They will be selecting cats to wear GPS trackers on their collar that will keep location records and accelerometer data to infer what the cat is doing, such as running, hunting, or sleeping. The pet owners can then upload the data to be later analyzed. The study also aims to better educate cat owners about the risk of owning a cat that is infected, and in doing so, help reduce the stray cat population. One of our goals is, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're using pet owners and their cats to understand a, a disease process. Mm -hmm. We'd also like to give back to the community because, um, you know, if because of the, the effect of the parasite on immunocompromised individuals or, or fetuses, sometimes if a, a, a household, there's a pregnancy there or someone has an issue, they get rid of the cat. Mm -hmm. And that increases the, the, the stray cat problem. And um, it turns out that in many cases that's, that's not necessarily the right response or even an import, a, a good response. It, you know, if, if, if we can show whether, you know, if the, if the parasite has, if the cat has been exposed to the parasite, the cat has an immune 
response to that parasite, it's like having the flu. You probably won't get it again, at least not the same strain. Mm -hmm. And so that cat actually may be, it may be good to have that cat. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is a question, right? It's really, it depends on whether that cat is still shedding parasite. And um, that's another question we're, we're interested in addressing. There are steps you can take to prevent yourself or your feline friend from contracting the parasite. This includes keeping your cat indoors, cleaning the litter box with latex gloves and a face mask, and thoroughly washing kitchen utensils. He's a good cat. Follow these rules and you'll have many lovable years with your murder mittens. I'm R.C. Miller for MavRadio.fm. If you are interested in this research project and would like to help contribute, feel free to go to ToxoProject.com and you can read more and take the Toxo Knowledge Survey. Now, R.C. Miller joining us right now. Uh, I have some questions for you regarding your story. Um, how many cats in the local Omaha area are infected with this uh, disease? Well, right now, it looks like about 12% of the feline population in Omaha, Nebraska is infected with uh, the parasite, um, which is actually a little bit lower than the average. Usually it's around 20%, so it's pretty decent in Omaha. And how worried should people be about this parasite potentially affecting their lives? Really, most people don't have to worry unless they're immunocompromised in some fashion or uh, even if you're pregnant, as long as you take some precautions such as, you know, using gloves and stuff when you uh, clean out the litter box, you should be fine. Most normal healthy adults, they can go their whole lives without ever having to worry about this uh, parasite. Now, this project has already kind of developed into its second phase. Um, how is this project progressing as a whole? Yeah, it's actually progressing, well, prior to the outbreak, it was progressing fairly well. Uh, they were sending out GPS trackers. They got their second shipment of GPS trackers in for cats, and they were getting them in and recording data was coming in pretty quickly uh, to monitor the progression of the parasite. Well, RC, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about uh, an interesting parasite that, frankly, I didn't know about going into this that really could affect a lot of everyday people, but a great story, and thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Ben. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, RC. We now bring in Kevin Kabor, who ventured outside the box to tell a story and also give us some insight on an event he covered earlier this year. First off, Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. And yourself, Ben? Good, good. Thank you again for joining us. So you made the intro to our broadcast that uh, led us off here. Um, had footage of the empty cities, obviously, with COVID-19. Uh, what was your thought process making the video like that and sort of the uh, stylistic way you created it? Yeah, so originally I had a complete opposite plan and scripted and even shot the video, but then COVID-19 happened and I thought it would be, it would be oblivious not to incorporate that in some way. So that's why the empty cities and all of that came about. Yeah, exactly. We're living in a crazy time. I think you mentioned that the Earth Day, this is going to be different than any other what do you think the significance that this Earth Day can have, obviously, with what, while we're being a little bit more reflective on the Earth that we live in? I think it's, it'll be impactful because we see in Italy and China that the skies have cleared and the water have become more clear than ever before. So that is also going into Sophia's like waste-free process. Like us being home and not wasting as much as usual has a positive impact on Earth. So we are the problem and we need to be the solution. Very insightful. And additionally uh, to the video you made, you covered the MLK rally earlier this year. Uh, Going to do a story on that. Obviously, ulterior things uh, led to that change. But can you speak about what that experience was like for you to cover that MLK rally? Yeah, that was very impactful for me because most of it was done by high schoolers to elementary school students. So they were between the ages of seven to 10 to 17. So seeing them that passionate and engaged about bringing change was inspiring to see. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Kevin. Thank yeah. you for the mm -hmm. insight. Uh, appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, Matt, back yeah. to you. Yeah, now we go to Lillian Griffith's uh, really powerful story here. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawed discrimination based on race, religion, and sex in the United States. It's a difficult topic for most people to tackle because 1964 wasn't that long ago and African-American history wasn't taught in schools until the 1970s. The boomer generation often protested learning black history in schools. According to NBC News, most students don't hear of black history much beyond Harriet Tubman, a limited view of slavery, and Martin Luther King. 
Jennifer Harbour sips her coffee and stares out the window as she contemplates her purpose and time as a professor. She's a white woman teaching African American history, and even though she has to prove herself every day to be there, Harbour believes her job is essential. According to socialstudies.org, only 8% of K-12 history in the United States is devoted to African Americans, which is about one to two lessons per school year. Figuring out what part of history I wanted to do, um, and it became clear to me in graduate school that uh, there wasn't a lot of people writing about African American history, and that was 20 years ago, but um, there's so much that still needs to be written. Harbor doesn't think it is a problem with modern educators, but a problem with state education funding, which is run by the boomer generation. Um, it's both. I mean, I think some schools do try to teach it. I mean, OPS definitely has a person who's in charge of their social studies curric curriculum who really tries, I think, to, um, to incorporate that. But there's not a lot of money for the program, and so a lot of people are introduced to African American history for the first time when they get here. Excluding important information in the classroom is not a new issue. It has been talked about since James Lowen's first Lies My Teacher Told Me, Volume 1 in 1955, a book disputing how history is overlooked in education with black history at the forefront. I mean, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's very easy for Americans to have what I call historical amnesia because nobody likes to talk about slavery and nobody likes to talk about white supremacy and racism. Um, so it's more comfortable, I think, for people when they develop programs just to not put it in there and to just put in, you know, the heroes, right? Like, so everybody can talk about Martin Luther King because that's a very safe subject. Harbor calls Generation Z to bring the lack of African-American education to the forefront. Um, I think your generation especially is really wanting more information and wanting much less denial. It's like climate change, right? Like, we're not going to discuss this denial thing, right? Like, we just know it exists and we, we should work on it rather than having fights about it, right? And, ha and having all this controversy about how it got here. Um, so I think your generation is really cognizant of that. If students don't sign up for classes such as Professor Harbor's, Black Studies education may be hard to come by. Milan Bonner went through the Nebraska public school education system and doesn't feel like she learned much about her own history. I definitely um, think that I've learned a lot more about African American history from my family. Um, both of my parents are black and they have done a pretty good job educating me. Bonner says if students were better prepared in the education system, she thinks the amount of uneducated comments would decrease. Yeah, I think it's just a lot of confusion from people and I know that People think it's weird that me and my siblings have different skin complexions because my siblings are significantly lighter than me. And so people just don't understand. It's just little things like that. It's Harbor and Bonner both agree early education is the solution to a more understanding world. Harbor says she can only do so much as a college professor. I just don't have a, a forum for it. If we don't create a forum for it when you're little, then nothing is going to develop as you grow up, right? So if, we, if we're not letting fourth graders talk about it, then how are we going to let adults talk about it? So I think part of it is that we don't do it when um, you're young. For MavRadio.fm, I'm Lillian Griffith. African American history has only been in the United States textbooks for 49 years. America is 240 years old, to put that in perspective. There's a lot more history to be added to our education system, and two lessons a year does not add up to Professor Jennifer Harbour. Lillian Griffith now joins us now. First and foremost, why did you choose a story like this? Um, I chose a story like this because, um, I mean, it's an issue that's not really talked about in our country. One to two lessons per year isn't fair to kids. Um, there's a lot more than the Industrial Revolution and colonization that goes on in our history. And, you know, like you said, there's a lot of things that are left out of curriculums. Um, what are some of the things that you've learned from learning an experience, a powerful experience like this that deals with America's history as a whole? Um, yeah, so I learned they, they only get one to two lessons. Um, and then that most of this stuff really settles in at fourth grade um, and that they don't get this in high school either. So I just learned that um, stuff resonates at a young age and you need to... Um, start there to kind of really make an impact. And how can the average person make a difference when it comes to the inclusion of uh, African-American education? Um, if you have a concern with uh, 
education in your area, contact your superintendent, um, see, ask what your kid's learning in school, make sure that they're actually getting an adequate education. So it's really important for the future because that's obviously, that's the next generation. Yeah, very important topic indeed. Lillian, thank you so much for covering a story like that and taking a chance to talk to us. Um, very, very powerful piece. Uh, back to you, Ben. Well, Matt, spring is in the air, which offers a fresh new opportunity to get active and in shape. Reporter Drew Peterson had the pleasure to interview a few people from the University of Nebraska Medical Center gym to have them share about their experience on what it's finally like to have nice weather back and get their exercise. It is March. You wake up and you hear the birds chirping. You put on some spring weather clothes. You walk outside. You feel a small breeze and you smell the fresh air of spring. Then you realize that the nice weather has finally returned. Spring also means that people can get back outside and exercise. Peter Pellerito, a fitness specialist at the UNMC Center for Healthy Living, believes that even though all year is a good time for exercising, people should take advantage to get out and exercise with the return of the nice weather. I think that spring is, is a great time to exercise. I actually believe that all year is a good time to exercise. Uh, but spring is, is a, a very good time uh, because it's, it's a reminder, it's a trigger, just like New Year's, um, that it's time to get out and get active. And uh, although I think people can be outside all year uh, if, if they dress correctly, it's, a, it's an opportunity for many people to get outside who have been indoors over the long cold winter. Pellerito enjoys doing many things while exercising throughout the year. That includes being on the treadmill, the ellipticals, and the bicycle. But when the springtime hits, that's when Pellerito starts to have big plans moving forward. I like to be outside on the weekends and, and on uh, Saturdays would be my long day to get outside and play. So I'll be outside um, hopefully for a big chunk of the day going for bicycle rides every Saturday this spring and summer. During the spring, Pellerito enjoys riding his bike. He always looks to take advantage of it every weekend when he has free time away from work. In the spring, I like to ride my bicycle and through the summer when it's warm and, and dry. Uh, some people ride bicycles all year long, but for me it's too hard to ride my bike in the winter. It is determined that people are more likely to lose weight in the summer more than in the winter because of the nice weather that returns. With the nice weather coming in, Pellerito already has big plans ahead of him and he is already looking forward to them. I'm going to start to get ready for a bike ride in June called Bran or the Bike Ride Across Nebraska. So I look forward to, um, to starting to gradually increase my mileage. So I'm ready to, to do those bike riding days on the Brand Ride, which you know probably average around 50 or 60 miles over the course of, of a typical day as we pedal across the state. Mike McGlade, the Senior Dean Associate for Administration and the Director of Finance, comes into the gym every single weekday during his work break. During the winter, McGlade prefers to stay inside at the UNMC Center for Healthy Living gym to work out. But when spring hits, not only does he love bike riding, but he also enjoys the things he does around his house. So when the spring weather hits, I enjoy exercising uh, more outside than inside. My, the exercising I like to do outside begins with actually working around the yard. I love to get our gardens all cleaned out of the sticks and the leaves and the garbage. That involves lots of bending over, that involves some digging, that involves carrying of soil and rocks and whatever it is that I need to move around from here and there in, in order to um, get things looking nice. Spring is also a time for McGlade for when he exercises more not just on his own, but also with his family as well. Because I think there are more opportunities in the spring to just get out and, and be active. Whether I'm involved with another family member, um, whether I'm involved with some of our great nieces and great nephews kicking a ball around, 
or just taking a walk around. Uh, we live out by Lake Flanagan, whether we're taking a walk around the lake and visiting. McGlade is also hoping to get more exercise and set goals for himself as we move on to the nicer weather. He also enjoys exercising with another one of his friends, especially at the Center for Healthy Living gym. The March equinox can either be observed on the 19th, the 20th, or the 21st, depending on the Gregorian calendar. This year, the first day of spring is March 19th. For Mavradio.fm, I'm Drew Peterson. The Center for Healthy Living is a gym that offers various memberships for people not only around UNMC, but also around the UNO campus. Have the pleasure now of welcoming in Drew Peterson. Drew, describe to me the Center for Healthy Living gym. Well, the Center for Healthy Living gym is a uh, gym that is open to all the University of Nebraska, and it has a tons of like rooms. It has like an elliptical room, a uh, weight room, and a gym, and an, all kinds of fitness classrooms. So, yeah, it's one of the best gyms to uh, go to to uh, work out. Now, Drew, after you've talked to some of the experts in this field, do people come into the gym more in the winter or in the spring and the summertime? Well, they come in more in the winter than the spring because it's it's impossible to uh, exercise outside during the winter because of how cold it is and to do anything outside during the winter because normally people in the spring will be out um, walking around and exercising or running or doing all those other kind of activities. Now, Drew, what's your opinion or experience on exercising in the spring more than in the winter? It can be a little bit easier to get out once it's springtime. Yes, it really can get um, easier in the springtime. The reason why I think of that is because um, normally I'm more motivated to uh, uh, work out in the spring than the winter because normally I get to the gym during the spring, but with all the gyms closed during the uh, pandemic, sometimes I walk around uh, the neighborhood that I live in. Um, either I walk around or I jog um, just to get out and get some exercise. True. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Now, Matt, I know I've been trying to get out and get active, and it's, it's hard. I know you've been trying to do the same thing, but trying to stay active at this time is really tough. It really is. And, I mean, the, I think everybody collectively is finding unique ways to do it, whether it be going on walks, uh, just finding different ways to stay within your little bubble and go outside. I mean, there's many different things you can do, and I think people are, you know, coming up with very unique ways to try to do that. And I think that that's really healthy for a lot of people, not only physically but mentally. I think being able to get outside and enjoy some fresh air in a time like this where there's a lot of uncertainty, um, I think that that's really good for everybody. And frankly, I think everybody needs to keep taking advantage of this situation that we're all kind of stuck in. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And just trying to get out and even in the backyard and throw around the, the ball with the dog is even a little bit better than just staying inside all day. But you're right. But now we have to shift gears to a little bit more serious story that we have on tap here, Matt. Yeah, Ashanti Allen with a, with a great story about a problem that's really been plaguing uh, the city of Omaha for a while. Um, when you drive into Omaha, you're welcome with the Union Pacific Railroad train car lit up and shining bright. You hear people talk about how Omaha is a great place to live and a great place to raise your family. Um, however, there's an underlying issue uh, that's not necessarily mentioned when you're looking for a house, uh, child care, or just a place of belonging. Um, Ashanti Allen has a great story about the soil lit issue in the city of Omaha. The American Smelting and Refining Company's home was near the Missouri River, contaminating areas in both North and South Omaha and surrounding areas with lead. There was a large smelting plant on the river downtown here that over the course of from about the late 1800s to about the early 1900s, as the emissions from the smokestacks went into the air, it settled out, the prevailing winds carried it across North and South Omaha. The Omaha area has had at least 100 companies that polluted the areas of North and South Omaha and surrounding areas while using lead through their refinement processing and manufacturing processes. Some of the main polluters consist of the Union Pacific Railroad, NL Industries, Lawrence Shot and Lead Company, Gold Inc., just to name a few. These companies were constructed on the banks of the Missouri River starting in 1870. The Omaha Smelting Works was the leading smelting works in the United States by 1880. Just a young boy growing up, Charles Fisher tested positive for lead. He was four years old. He and his family lived in a low-income neighborhood in Council Bluffs called Place 5, which was not a part of the Superfund cleanup. 
even though it was directly across the Missouri River. St. Joe Medical had told them at the time was that they blamed them for letting us eat paint chips, um, but that just wasn't the case at all. Uh, then they, they knew that it was bad. Uh, they knew that it was going to be a problem, and the doctor told them it was going to be some developmental issues. Children who ingest lead into their system can suffer from learning disabilities, such as mental retardation, seizures, coma, or even death can be a result of lead ingestion. The Omaha Public Schools District and the Council Bluff Schools provide free lead screenings to children who live in high lead level neighborhoods. Got lucky. For, for me, it was more physical issues um, and it kind of points to some bone growth. Uh, developmentally, we all had, um, I think the best you can point to is uh, behavioral issues um, and uh, the IQ problems, I don't think, was necessarily the biggest situation, but it was a ADHD um, and just kind of passed off as, oh, those are just some dumb poor kids more than anything else uh, with a little bit of hyperactivity and just can't quite focus and they're always angry. Well, it must be their upbringing. If you Google search, there are several different organizations in the community that offer free services to help test children and homes, such as Charles Drew Health Center, the Omaha Douglas County Health Center, the HEPA program, which provides a vacuum to families that qualify, and healthy kids. These organizations provide families with key information on keeping lead from contaminating their home. Lead has resurfaced its way back into the soil in North and South Omaha and surrounding areas. Officials with the lead office are tasked with deciding the next steps for the cleanup process. In the early years of 1999 to 2000, the EPA began their cleanup campaign, working on high contaminated houses first. In 2015, the EPA finished their cleanup project, even though there was still work to be done. The cost of abatement is expensive, but with help, it can be accomplished. We said we couldn't pay for it, but they're like, well, we've got funding available. Um, so like I said before, we continued it, we've staffed it, and we are now continuing to clean up yards. We will have cleaned up, um, we have eight, scheduled to do about 100 this year. We did 50 about each of the last three years. So we'll have done after this year probably close to 250 yards that we've cleaned up. There is still lead in the soil, but not as much as when it first began. The person who had lead in their system as a young child has overcame the struggles through life. He now helps others and shares his story of how he and his siblings were infected. Charles Fisher works at the University of Nebraska Omaha in the Creative Media Lab. He teamed up with an organization and created an app that explores fun ways that kids can learn about lead. We uh, got connected with Omaha Healthy Kids and the EPA and ended up making a video game, um, a mobile game that's completely free, still five stars on, on Google. So download it, check it out, uh, called Healthy Home Heroes. For MAV Radio, I'm Ashanti Allen. Lead continues to be a problem for Omaha residents as the cleanup project rolls along. Ashanti Allen is now joined with us live to answer some questions on that matter. Now, Ashanti, what exact areas are a part of this super fun cleanup that's going on? Uh, so like the north uh, areas, like downtown areas in South Omaha, um, nothing past uh, 72nd, but more of like uh, the downtown and uh, more into the north area is affected. Now, is, is the lead moving or is it just kind of in that area to stay and you know, not really moving around because it's kind of the soil stays stationary? Well, it's not moving, but when the cleanup process is being done, that soil is picked up and placed into another uh, area and the uh, soil, the lead in the soil is still contaminated. So is there a cleanup process for the Council Bluffs area considering it's close proximity to the North Omaha area? Council Bluffs area, no, there is not a plan as of now. Um, probably in the near future there could be, but as of right now there is no plan uh, for that cleanup in the Council Bluffs area. And with the lead being so engraved in the soil over the last, you know, however many decades, how can one person, say, living at a house with uh, soil being infected with lead, how can a person become infected with lead? Uh, a person, like, uh, like I said, children, uh, you know, they like to play outside. So anything with, like, uh, playing in the soil, putting their hands in their mouth, um, some of those um, 
lead has spread onto the houses. So there's uh, paint, lead paint. So even like paint chips, uh, kids can pick those up and put them in their mouth. Um, what they're asking um, is that when you go come in the house, you make sure you wash your hands, um, you vacuum up those paint chips that you see and just try to keep a clean house so that um, contamination can be low. Well, Ashanti, thank you so much for talking about this. I know it's a story you've covered in the past, so you're kind of an expert when it comes to this topic. I appreciate you sharing your insight with all of us. Great story. Um, ben, back to you. Well, a living museum of unique four season plant displays maintained to the highest standards consistent with environmental stewardship is how it is described. Omaha, Nebraska is home to the largest botanical gardens here in the United States, known as Laritzen Gardens. Go discover a hidden sanctuary in the heart of the city right after you learn about its great history. Reporter Jack Delperding has more. In 1982, after two years of preliminary planning, a former Omaha World Herald Garden Parade columnist named Helena Street hosted a meeting consisting of five environmentalists. The goal of that meeting was simple, yet the execution would be tough. The goal was to start planning a botanical garden in Omaha. The garden's creation came about because of the contributions of donors, board members, volunteers, and staff. Spencer Cruz, executive director of Lords and Gardens since 1996, drove that development. He recently retired, though his legacy lives on. Cruz had more than 30 years of experience specializing in landscape architecture, horticulture, and botanical garden management. Since the opening of the Visitor and Education Center in October 2001, the number of staff members under Cruz has significantly increased from five. We were able to manage the project with a very small amount of people. And now we just have continued to grow as we offer more programs, as we add more gardens. Um, and in the summertime now, we get very close to 70 employees. The construction on the Rose Garden of Lords and Gardens began in 1995, and soon other gardens were developed as well. Those gardens included a shade Osta garden, an herb garden, a children's garden, and a spring flowering walk. To a lot of people, those are some of the more special areas due to their history, and the history of Lords and Gardens is especially important to Cruz. The history for me is, is important because I've had a part in it since we started building, but prior to that there was this long history of getting the community behind the idea. The garden also features a parking garden and a rival garden with annual and perennial flowers. Since the opening of Lords and Gardens, new garden areas have been added each year. Some of the more famous ones include the Rose Garden Staircase and Woodland Waterfall in 2004 and Marjorie K. Doherty Conservatory, a $20 million greenhouse addition in 2014. But Director of Conservation Jim Locklear says the most famous one does not lie within those three. Throughout the seasons, our model railroad garden is probably our biggest draw. In fact, we've done some surveys, and that's what our, uh, our visitors love the most. It's just kind of a magical experience for people. Over the years, Lords and Gardens has celebrated many different outside events that for some are once-in-a-lifetime opportunities, but also benefits the gardens. Weddings are a very important uh, uh, source of revenue for us because, you know, we charge a rental fee and that helps defray the cost of operations. But weddings are not the only thing that Lords and Gardens features. We have a lot of uh, festivals. Um, our, we have a big uh, Railroad Days festival. Uh, we also have some, some uh, Goldenrod festival, things that are related to what's in bloom. 24 years after they first opened their doors, the site thrives near downtown Omaha. And while Lords and Gardens does have a tradition-rich history, Jim says they hope to have many more years of new people coming to their site to enjoy such a great spectacle. For Mavradio.fm, I'm Jack Delperding. Laritz and Gardens hosted 220,000 visitors last year, up from the previous two years, and is currently doing very well with more than 12,000 member households. As you can tell, Laritz and Gardens has had some major history behind it, and now we bring in Jack Delperding to talk about some of that history. Jack, you were going to be at Laritz and Gardens today. Obviously, unforeseen circumstances limited that, but describe some of your past experiences at the garden. 
Yeah, I went to the gardens for a different class just to get some video, and I ended up spending a lot more time there than I thought. You know, they have the parking garden and the arrival garden, which out in front during the spring can be really beautiful. And since I did go in the spring, they had the Rose Garden Staircase and Woodland Waterfall. Those were in season, and those were really beautiful. So just spent a lot more time there than I expected to. What new exhibits, if any, do they have? Or maybe if they have, or if you've had a favorite exhibit that you saw while you were there? Uh, they, when I talked with, uh, when I interviewed Jim Locklear and Spencer Cruz, uh, they had just come out with the Lego exhibit. Uh, and uh, it's current, Lords and Gardens is currently closed right now, I believe. Um, but once they reopen, uh, and then... They said that they don't have any plans for anything in the future, but that they'll start thinking about that uh, coming up soon because uh, those take a couple years to develop. Very cool. I was hoping to get to that Lego exhibit myself before it moved out, but um, if someone were to visit the gardens, how long should they put aside for their visit? Yeah, as I, it definitely depends on the season that you're in because uh, if you go in the spring, as I did, as I mentioned, they have the Rose Garden and the Woodland Waterfall along with the parking and arrival garden. So that would probably be like two hours, I would say. But even if you go in the winter when they don't have that or the flowers uh, within those exhibits aren't in bloom, they still have the conservatory inside, which, which can take up a bunch of time. And it, the inside of the building is really beautiful as well. Absolutely. And with the zoo being so close, sometimes maybe the and Gardens falls to the wayside, but certainly a hidden gem as far as Omaha is concerned. Thanks, Del. All right, Matt, back to you. Yeah, Ben, there are nearly 1.3 million active military members in the United States, and behind each military member, there are countless family members joining them through this tough process. Jessica Salinas dives into one veteran's life to see what he had to sacrifice for our country. America is known to be the land of dreams, opportunities, and freedom, but all that comes with a cost for our men and women serving in the military. Being part of the U.S. military is no simple task. You have to be physically, mentally, and emotionally strong knowing you'll have to sacrifice parts of your life for the freedom of others. Jimmy Aguilar started following in his father's footsteps. He recalls the time where he had to share the news with his family. My dad was really happy. He was very proud of me. Uh, my mom was really upset. She didn't want me to leave home. Danny, Jimmy's younger brother, says, I was bummed out about losing my brother because I knew that he'd be gone for a while, for a long time. Jimmy served in the Air Force for 20 years. He was able to climb the ranks to technical sergeant. Even though all these years have gone by, he can still remember. My first day of basic training was April 30th, 1997, which was my 21st birthday. So I was pretty miserable. Um, you would think you'd be out partying and, you know, enjoying your 21st birthday, but I was in San Antonio getting yelled at. Uh, a little tired from flying around and being corralled by all these, like, military people. Joining the Air Force meant he had to leave the comforts of home, leaving behind friends and family in El Paso, Texas. Jimmy was deployed to several different parts of the world where he had to endure long flights, long nights, and a long time away from his family. While Jimmy was stationed in Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota, in the process of changing duty stations, his father's health was deteriorating. His brother, Danny, recalls. Right around the time that I was uh, graduating from high school, our father got really sick. Um, he was just in and out of a hospital. And by the time I was 19 years old, uh, my brother was already in the Air Force. My, my father passed away. This was one of many tough times he went through in his career. It's just being away from your family all the time. Mm -hmm. I think that was the worst for me because I was gone a lot. So yeah, it kind of hurt my relationships and family and my kids and stuff. So. Which led to multiple marital problems and divorces. 13 years into his service, his mother Rosa vividly remembers Jimmy telling her he wanted to leave the Air Force. She was heartbroken. I left and that hit me very hard because I said, oh no, if my father was here, he wouldn't be doing this guy. She was there to give her son the unconditional love and support he needed to continue. His mother was overjoyed with pride to see her son complete 20 years of duty. Jimmy says, I'm just happy I got to serve, and there's a sense of pride 
and a sense of like brotherhood and you know there's only a certain handful of people that serves in the military so i'm kind of proud of that his family was overjoyed with his dedication and service i mean my brother's been able to travel the world a lot he's been to places uh, i'm sure i'll never get to see our freedom comes with a cost not just for those with boots on the ground but for those waiting for their loved ones to come back home i, I guess i'm being uh selfish because I mean, I wish I had my brother closer, but um, I'm happy for that. For MavRadio.fm, I'm Jessica Salinas. We want to thank all our military members as well as their family members for their continued service to our country. Now, Jessica Salinas joins us now. Now, Jessica, at what age can you join the military legally? So you can join at the age of 17, um, but you can you would need your parents' consent. Um, you can join eight at the age of 18 without your parents' consent. Um, but you have to join before you're the age of 35. And when looking at military members, a lot of the times people forget how tough it is for people, you know, necessarily living at home, you know, waiting for their family members to come back. Um, what is there a branch in particular that maybe has a, a more difficult issue with relationships? Like, is there a branch that maybe has like the highest divorce rate? Yeah, there is. According to military.com and Market Watch, um, they were looking at like how they got deployed and like how long they've been away from their family. And that branch would be the Navy there. I guess they have like a nine to 12 months um, time of deployment. So that's um, the biggest branch that gets divorced. So when did Jimmy graduate from his 20 years of service in the military? So he graduated in 2017. So not that long ago. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for diving into such an interesting story, dealing with family members and their difficulties, you know, trying to stay in touch with their loved ones in the military. Uh, definitely a great story. Ben, back to you. Thanks, Matt. And that does it for our stories today. Obviously, a little bit different than we usually do our Earth Day event, but it's still a tradition around here. We love doing it. And I think Doing it under these circumstances, Matt, honestly makes you kind of appreciate the world we live in, how important the earth is, how important it is to get out and to uh, make a difference in the environment, the people that make up this world and how unique each one is. I think it's just cool to reflect on that we're doing it within our own houses, but it also makes us appreciate uh, just how nice of a world we live in. Very much so. I mean, like you said, it puts it in perspective. There's a lot of people right now who are dealing with a lot of difficult situations surrounding the current climate in this country a lot of families that are hurting right now. So the fact that we can sit here behind our computer screens and uh, cover some really cool stories about Earth Day, things going around the city of Omaha, different businesses, shining some light on those. I think that that's super cool that we get that opportunity. And um, this is something that we're gonna remember forever. I mean, being able to do a show like this behind a, ca a computer screen. I mean, this is something that history books are gonna detail for decades. This is, this is history in the making right here, the fact that we're even doing a show over a computer screen. So I think that this is an excellent opportunity for myself, for you, and for everybody involved. And uh, this has been tremendous. This has been excellent being able to do a show like this. Absolutely, Matt. Thank you. I echo every word you just said. And it's always fun to do one of these with you. So I appreciate it, Matt. Thank you for that. And for all of us here at MavRadio.fm, all our reporters, Jody and Brownlee, our instructor, Matt Kirkle, I have been Ben Howick. Thank you so much for joining us for this 2020 edition of Birthday Stay Safe. And remember to appreciate the earth that we call home.